Good morning, y'all, and welcome back to the garden. Today, we're going to be going over some drip irrigation basics for the average homeowner, which I'm really passionate about. I speak about it a lot on my channel, and I don't know if you, any of you have implemented drip because of me, uh, but it is a really effective way of watering your garden. Some of the benefits of drip is less water usage. Uh, you're actually watering the plant versus watering the soil around it. So there's less opportunities for weed growth, which a lot of people in my prior garden would always comment, well, why don't you have weeds in your garden? Uh, I did have weeds in my garden, but I had fewer weeds because I had drip irrigation on those flower beds. So there were not opportunities to water weed seeds and them to germinate. Um, it's also, you don't have to have a sprinkler system to utilize drip irrigation. And this video is going to be focused primarily on people who don't have sprinkler systems like myself currently at this new home. If you do have a sprinkler system, I would recommend you go two years back and watch the video I did. It's called, I think, Drip 101. Uh, I will actually link it in the description below as well because you can convert existing overhead sprayer heads to drip if you, for instance, have overhead sprayers in your garden beds. You don't want to mix sprayer heads, and that's all I'll say about that. If you want more information, you can go watch that video. But for now, we're going to dive right in. I've changed a little bit of my storage setup because I have so many different supplies now, and I really recommend you go out there and the first part of your drip system be, if you're putting one in, is buy a storage solution. I switched them to the Milwaukee Packout system uh, last October. November, December, during the holidays, Home Depot and Milwaukee have a lot of great deals. If you buy a certain dollar amount, you get, you know, so much cheaper. And so they have a really effective system. It's like a cabinet with drawers, which I keep all my big fittings in. I keep some of my small um, pipe in. And then the top here is a tiny, tiny one that I organize all of my quarter inch uh, drip fittings and my emitters in. And in the middle here is just a bunch of random stuff. So we're going to start with the backbone of the drip system. So I'm going to be connecting directly to my hose bib um, or the hose spigot on the side of my home. Part of that, which you do not have to have, is a timer system. Um, I have a Wi-Fi connected system by Orbit that I've used for over three years now, and it has worked really well for me. I actually upgraded to their new timers uh, when I moved into this home because I did not have a sprinkler system and I really love them uh, much better and I'll show you why in a moment when we go up there. I know there's a lot of systems out there for smart timers and I would say invest in a brand that you trust because before I had the Orbit system I had a system that was kind of new to the market. I can't remember if I supported them on Kickstarter or not. Um, but I think it was called Zilker, uh, and the timer was kind of, it worked, you know, pretty well. Uh, my problem was it, with it is it would never tell me if it couldn't water the garden. Um, these new systems have like flow sensors in them, so if the water got turned off, it would alert you potentially that uh, it wasn't able to water the garden. But because they're all cloud-based, that company lasted maybe a year or so and then it went under. And then I had paid $150, which it was overpriced at the time because these mark these timers were new to the market. They were one of the first ones kind of coming into it. Um, and it was useless and I had to throw it away because I couldn't use it anymore. The app didn't work, which couldn't send signals to the timing device. So since that time, uh, I just said, I'm gonna stick with Orbit. Orbit is a tried and trusted brand that's been around a really long time. Uh, I will say their app is maybe not the best, um, but it is really good at what it does. And it has a lot of smart watering features that I've not tried yet uh, in my last garden. I did a lot of manual timing. But let's get directly into some things you need to start working on drip. So this is going to be kind of an in-depth video. I want to walk you through everything you have to be successful from start to end. So when you're connecting anything to your hose bib like this, the first thing you want is really a backflow device. Uh, a lot of the things you're going to see that I'm using in this video are by Rainbird. I really like the Rainbird brand because they're easy to find. Uh, when I got started, I used the Dig brand and I was ordering a lot of that online. I still order a lot of my drip supplies from Amazon because they're cheaper, honestly. But that is a tiny, tiny device that looks like this. 
And all it does is it prevents water from the system going back into your hose bib on the side of your house. So this will be the first thing you connect to your water hose. And this is all it looks like. And I will put links below to all of these things. I have a really extensive list the last time I did this video that had everything you need in it. I may just end up repasting that below and editing a couple things now that I've found some better options for connectors specifically. Uh, after that, you can put your timer. You can use a manual timer. You don't have to use a timer at all if you don't want to invest in one that would just require you to manually turn it on and remember to turn it off. Uh, if you choose to use a timer, your timer can go next. The third thing, uh, if or the second thing, if you're not using a timer, would be a pressure regulator, which in this garden I'm not going to be using. Uh, I'm going to call this step optional. Most strip zones work most effectively between 25 and 30 psi. Typically homes are kind of like regulated automatically by a pressure regulator. In the home that's sometimes under 40 so it's really not a big issue if you are coming from a sprinkler system where maybe there's not a pressure regulator uh, between where the water comes from the city or the well to the hose bib you might want to insert one because what you'll result in is emitters blowing off your hoses connections blowing off uh, and that type thing. So I have not seen that happen on the drip that I've got set up so far. So I'm not going to be adding a pressure regulator to um, my drip zones at this home. If I start experiencing issues with fittings or emitters blowing off, I will add one. I don't suspect that's going to happen though. Um, and what happens if you don't use a pressure regulator is you may get more flow and more pressure to do a further length of irrigation through drip. Now let's talk about that briefly because that is something that's really going to depend and I can't really tell you. Uh, there are recommendations on how long to run. You can run drip line as far as linear feet. Uh, but it also depends on how many emitters are on that linear feet, what your pressure is at the hose bib. And so I can't tell you how much um, linear feet you're going to be able to run. I can tell you that I can run at my last home way over what the estimated range is. And what happens if you have too much linear feet is that emitters may just not emit their um, estimated gallons per hour at the emitter. So a lot of the emitters that I use, the plug ones are two gallons per hour. I typically use those for plugs. The ones that you'll find built into tubing that I'll show you in a moment are oftentimes one gallon per hour. So what happens if you have too much <coughs> linear feet is pressure over the entire system is reduced and you might not be getting that full one gallon per hour or two gallons per hour at the emitter. And I'll talk to you briefly about the emitters here in a moment and why I recommend a specific type because it helps uh, compensate for that. Uh, I think you'll see somewhere between three and 400 linear feet online oftentimes. Uh, I can tell you that I watered my entire last garden on, I think there were two maybe three zones the entire thing my entire one-third uh, of an acre was watered with two or three zones so after you put your pressure emitter on if you need it you will want something to connect your hose to that fitting so this little fitting connects half inch tubing which it can be either this black distribution tubing or emitter tubing uh, it kind of unscrews here and then you slide. These are all, these fittings are all different by the way. So this is just the one I have from Amazon. It slides over and then you connect it to your hose bib because it's a standard hose end connector or your timer. Uh, and you screw this back on and it provides a nice fitting. So there's a barb here that inserts. Most uh, drip connectors are going to have a barb that inserts in the center. Uh, of the hose and then you tighten this end down to tighten the connection on the pipe. So that's all you need to get started. And from there, the possibilities are really endless. There are a million different connectors. Let's talk initially about the tubes that I've mentioned a couple times in this video. This is black distribution tubing. Think of this as a rigid water hose that you're using to get water from one point to another point. And so this is what I will run 
from the hose bib till I get to the bed where I need water. It's possible that your hose bib is directly in the bed that you want to water. And in that case, you don't need to use black irrigation tubing. You can use brown emitter tubing if you want. This stuff can also have holes punched in it, or you can punch holes in it using a multitude of devices. The one I'm going to show you is one I recommend, and I'll have a link to it below. So you may see these at, if you're going to like a big box store, these are horrible. They have a barb in them, you put them over them and you got to press kind of even. If not, you can get the hole uneven in the pipe. What I recommend and what I've used for years is this little thing. It's called a, I call it a gun. It's a hole punch gun and the pipe fits perfectly in the center and you squeeze and it's really easy and it punches a hole perfectly in the center of the pipe and then you can insert a meter. So this stuff I will use often in beds where there's mostly shrubs because I can actually insert the emitters that I want into it. Um, or if you want to water like perennials or a bed of perennials, you can pick out brown, which this is Rainbird uses black and brown. I don't know what all brands use, but I use Rainbird Supply. So typically that's what everyone uses as black for distribution tubing and brown for emitter tubing. And emitter tubing, the only difference here is these have built-in emitters. And I don't know if you can see there, there's a little black dot right there. This tubing, a roll of tubing, has emitters every 18 inches uh, and it is a 100 foot roll. And so every emitter emits one gallon per hour or it's like 0.9 i think is the technical term or the technical amount yeah so it says half inch emitter tubing pre-installed emitters every 18 inches 0.9 gph which is gallon per hour so you know if you run your system for an hour uh, every emitter on this length of tube is going to put out 0.9 gallons in that hour so that gives you an estimate of how long you need to run your system for as well I can't really tell you that either. It's going to depend on your soil, the plant you're watering. I will tell you at my last home, I typically ran, which I have heavy clay, which holds a lot of water, um, about half an hour every couple of days, uh, depending on how hot the weather is. So there's a lot of conditions there. You'll just have to work out yourself. Think of it as you're pouring water from a flower uh, watering can onto the ground. How much water does this shrub need? If you think it needs two gallons of water or a two gallon can, you would want to run this system for two hours and it would do two gallons at every emitter. So that's just kind of the way you have to think about it in your brain because it can get, you know, kind of confusing potentially. Now, the next part of half inch uh, drip, and it's the same for quarter inch drip, are the various connectors. There is a connector for every use case. We have a T, which I will be using today uh, if you want to connect to an existing run of pipe or if you want to connect one end if you're doing a loop to another. I would always recommend you connect the length of tube back to itself to ensure sufficient pressure throughout the entire zone and I'll talk a little bit more about that and show you that in the video when I put this together today. We have regular connectors. These just connect one tube to the other. So if you run out of your 100 foot tubing and you need to add another, add it on to the end here or you can connect the black tube to the brown tube and vice versa. Uh, and then we have, which you probably don't use very often, but I have them. They are 90 degree angle connectors. I like to use these when I come down from the hose bib because it goes down to the ground and sometimes you don't have enough room to bend uh, at an angle. This tubing here, because it can be pretty rigid and you don't want to kink it because uh, this stuff kinks and then it's really can't, it's difficult to get the kink out of it. It has kink memory because it's just a, a plastic. So this I will use and it will go straight to the ground and then parallel along the ground uh, the pipe will run which is really helpful. Now I've seen on Garden Answer Laura and them use um, these fittings that go around these tubes around these connectors and around these tubes. I have never used those. Um, the, I'm not sure exactly what their setup is, but it may be because they have too much pressure in their system and their fittings blow apart. Uh, the average homeowner, they're running off a well too, and I think they have an irrigation well. So they probably have a lot of pressure in their system. 
and they run a lot of irrigation. So uh, for the average homeowner, those aren't gonna be needed. I have never used one, um, and I don't expect I will need one at this home either. They also have valves that you connect. These are on-off valves, which I've used in some instances. I don't use these often uh, in my drip beds, but they are handy if you are connecting, for instance, you only have one zone available. Maybe you bought only one timer uh, and you're watering a shade bed and a sun bed all together, which need different water setups. You can turn off potentially like part of the zone if you need to, or part of the length. I also like to use these at the end of a system. For example, if you didn't tie it into each other, um, then you could put one of these instead of these little connectors here. These are really simple. They're like figure eights. You slide them on, you bend the tube, and then you slide it back this way, and that ends the terminal system of your drip, which, like I said, I don't recommend doing that necessarily. I always connect it back to itself to ensure even pressure, but in some instances, you may not be able to, and you just have to end the length of tubing. I also like to insert these at the end. They're a little more expensive. Um, they're a couple dollars a piece instead of, you know, a few dollars for eight of them or whatever it is, but what you get is the ability to open it and easily drain all the water from the system quickly. Let's talk about that briefly. People are concerned oftentimes, the last video, I don't think I covered it, uh, whether the system has to be winterized. No. Uh, I think my system was blowed out as part of my regular irrigation being blown out at my last home with pressurized air, is what I mean. Uh, they come put pressurized air and blow all the water out of the system here because it gets really cold and it can damage, you know, PVC pipe, which doesn't have any flexibility. Because your system has emitters all in it, uh, if there is a little leftover water, you don't really necessarily have the concerns of it freezing and busting. So you can leave, I would bring the, I would not leave it connected to your hose bib during winter. I would bring the timer inside, obviously, you don't want that damage from the cold, but you can buy actual little plugs, which I don't have any on hand, that will plug into where you connected it to the hose bib to keep anything from getting into it, and then just leave that out during winter, and then the system itself will also be fine during winter. You don't have to, this is not something you have to pull up every season um, or anything like that. Once it's on the ground, it's good, unless emitters get plugged and it has to be replaced in future years. Let's talk about the plugging of emitters. Um, I didn't have that happen really ever at all at my last house. If it did happen, uh, it was usually with the two gallon per hour individual emitters, and those are easy to pop in and out and replace. Now, that's going to depend on how hard your water is. Uh, at my last house, our water was very hard. Uh, but it was nowhere near as hard, I think, as this house is because we're on well water. And I don't know if that's something I will experience or not. Those are all the connectors for the half inch tubing, which half inch tubing is typically what you want to use in flower beds. You can, of course, use a combination of that. But half inch tubing is going to give you the availability to run the longest lengths with the most pressure. You definitely don't want to start with quarter inch tubing like this and connect it to half inch tubing because you're really necking down the volume of water coming into your system. But you can go from bigger lengths or bigger diameter tubing like the half inch to the quarter inch. Say you have a container, you want to run half inch to the container is really far away from the hose bib. You run half inch tubing, which is the bigger tubing here, the black big half inch until you get to the container that provides you lots of water flow and sufficient volume and pressure. And then you tee off of that into with quarter inch tubing and run that into the container. Um, you can also water individual plants from the half inch container with this quarter inch drip uh, if they're too far from uh, where your quarter or your, where your half inch tubing is running. So. I did that um, when I was setting up drip to the front garden bed. And after I finished setting up the system, I'll take you up there because I've not put molds down and show you how I ran that system around the sidewalk because it's really helpful. So there's black distribution tubing as well, which doesn't have holes in it for one quarter inch. And also there's one quarter inch distribution tubing with emitters in it as well. And I use these like in my vegetable garden, or if you have um, a small area that you want to water, that's kind of this bigger half inch tubing can be 
difficult to um, bend sometimes. You kind of have to be very gentle with it. This can obviously bend a little easier because it's thinner. Uh, this works really well. I would not recommend you water your entire garden bed unless it is a tiny garden bed with quarter inch drip tubing. You're not going to be able to run it as far. The pressure is going to be lower. The volume of water is going to be lower and you're just not going to be able to run it as far. Now, the reason I love my packout system is because they all stack them and clip into each other, but we're going to go over some of these emitter options. So quarter inch drip has the same connectors that half inch drip does. They're just tinier. So this is a T. We have plugs also. These are also sometimes called goof plugs. So you can actually end um, a quarter inch drip system by plugging in the end, or if you made a hole in half inch tubing and you don't need that emitter anymore, you can stick these plugs in there. And these are connected to each other in little eights or tens. Let me find you one that's, there you go. So it plugs in right there. Uh, and then you have individual couplings so you can connect either uh, quarter inch to quarter inch or you can connect half inch to quarter inch. And you poke a hole in the half inch, insert this, and then, then on the other end you insert the quarter inch. There are also 90s, but one of the most important parts obviously of the drip system are the emitters. And there are various gallon per hour emitters. The most common one that I purchase are the two gallon per hour. I tend to use those for shrubs, um, depending on what they are. One of them or two of them. Uh, it's also going to depend on how long you run your system. So if you have the availability to run your system for a long time, uh, several hours, you could do half gallon per hour emitters or one gallon per hour emitters. So these are going to cover a larger volume of water, two gallons. They also have four gallons, and I think I've seen five gallons. Um, but typically, you're not going to want to use four gallons very often. Now, based on the gallons per hour these emit, you'll either get a deeper watering or a bigger spread. So Half gallon per hour, not going to emit a whole lot over a gallon or over an hour. So the water is going to drip and it's going to probably spread out a little further um, as the water, as the ground soaks it up. Two gallon per hour is going to put out uh, more water per hour. And so it's going to go probably a little deeper and wider. Um, so just experiment. What I would probably recommend are the two gallon per hour for your shrubs if you're running them for 30 minutes or an hour. I've used the half gallon per hours on some boxwoods because I tend to not need quite as much water when I was planting a hedge of boxwoods. Um, I've also found out since I started that that boxwoods uh, don't need really a ton of water other than until they get established and so I didn't run any drip to any of the boxwoods that I planted um, within the last year or so at my other property. So experiment, make sure they have sufficient water. But some things, since I plant a lot of hydrangeas, are thirsty. And so they like lots of water. Now, there's one more tool I will show you, and it's this gun right here. And this allows you to easily connect emitters to the quarter inch drip tubing. Um, and let's see if I can pull one here and show you how they work. I'm not gonna connect one because I don't wanna waste an emitter. These can be removed um, and you can, reuse them. It's sometimes a pain to do, but I will often do it to kind of save the money there. So this is the emitter. You put it in this little device here and you insert your tubing on this side like this over the emitter top. And when you squeeze this, it pushes the tubing into the emitter. And I will always wear gloves with this, but that little tool's nice because if you do this for hours at a time, it can be really painful on um, your thumbs and your hands because it's just pu pushing tiny pieces, really hard plastic into tubing. So I really, really like that tool. Pushing these into the half inch tubing after you punched a hole with this other gun right here um, is really easy. You hear this satisfying click sound and that means it's perfectly in the tubing and then you can move on to the next one. So that's much easier. If you're dealing with quarter inch drip very often, I'd recommend you get that other tool. Now, let's talk about some other options for connectors to drip tubing. There are a ton of options. Uh, besides just the standard drip emitters. You can get sprayers. These sprayers are what I use for paths at my other home um, because you can't really run drip around very much through a path of like moss. Uh, just doesn't work very well. So you can overhead spray from a drip system 
and you can see it has a tiny connector right there and you connect the tubing to it. Now, this is not pressure compensating. One of the things I forgot to mention in the last video are the actual gallon per hour emitters, like the red one I showed you, one gallon, two gallon, four gallon, half gallon. Purchase pressure compensating emitters. What those things do is they evaluate, you know, it's kind of a dumb system, it's not a smart system, but over the system of all the emitters you have, they have some simple mechanical device in them that compensate if the pressure is low here or high here, and it evens out the water flow among the system. If you're using non-pressure compensating emitters, you could potentially get more water here, less water there. So I always purchase pressure compensating emitters. Most emitters are pressure compensating, but I know some are not. So I would recommend you get the pressure compensating ones, which I will link below um, in the description from Amazon probably. But then these things are really nice and I would probably put these on their own zone. I did not have these on their own zone at my last home uh, and so they will really reduce the amount of throughput that you can have and length of tubing because this is just spraying out water. There's nothing backing up and adding pressure to the system. So you can't use quite as many of these but if you need to pop one into your drip zone or two you potentially can uh, depending on how long. Now, if you have extra zones available, put these on their own zone, and then you can add lots of them if you need to. I may be integrating more of these into the large bed that I'm planting up front along the sidewalk to spray the perennial areas, because otherwise I'm gonna be having a ton of um, half inch tubing running everywhere in that big bed. I haven't decided yet. I may not use them, just may go ahead and use half inch tubing. Um, but these are really effective for finicky things like moss or ground covers that need water to look good, uh, don't mind being overhead watered, and it's efficient to cover a broad area very densely. Now that was a pop-up sprayer. Um, they also have sprayers that just stake and connect to the half or quarter inch strip. Um, these I use to water my Green Giant Arborvitae for the first year or so of their life after I planted them because I wanted all the soil around them uh, really saturated to make them grow really quickly. And this worked really well. So this I just got from Lowe's. Um, you can actually buy the whole thing. It comes with everything you need for a few dollars. And I kept all of them after I was done because they came in handy like watering um, some of the perennial flats that I get in every now and then. You can just overhead water them really efficiently. And it's a cheap way to do it. It has this built in on and off valve to control the spray, really effective. So those are lots of the options you have available. Something that I'm not going to be demonstrating in this video, but the next one that I'm also going to be shooting this afternoon is pretty new to the market and I'm really excited about it. Uh, and it's called a root quencher. And you dig a hole in the ground and you put this in there and this helps you problem solve areas and that need water on established plants or newly planted plants to give them a good amount of water uh, and what's really interesting about it is it opens up inside you can control the valve to how much water goes to it and you can insert fertilizer to water directly at the root system so i'm going to be showing you this in the next video of how i'm going to utilize this to assist with some problem areas i have but i'm really excited about it because my granddad used to um, put pvc pipe to all of the trees and shrubs that he planted um, which was also really effective at getting water to the root system, but white PVC pipe sticking out of the ground in an ornamental garden like mine isn't the prettiest, and this is a really effective solution to get that done. Now, before I conclude, uh, one last thing that we can add, which I'm not adding to my system. I actually bought this several years ago, and I never added it. Something I'm going to be doing in the spring is integrating a fertilization system into um, the strip irrigation. So there are devices out there. They're not necessarily super cheap, but they can feed irrigation. Say you want to add some fish fertilizer into your drip irrigation. They can feed fertilizer into your drip system to water and fertilize everything directly on that drip line with fertilizer. 
This thing right here is an actual filter. So if you have issues with debris in your line, say you're not using uh, water directly from your house or your well doesn't, you know, produce really clean water or you just have an irrigation well and you're not concerned about filtering it, this is a fine mesh filter that you can add at the beginning before you get to your timer. Um, I'm not going over that in this video because I've never used it. I've used city water or county water at my last house and here our well water is really good. So I don't need this, but if you have issues, there are filter systems you can add and essentially water goes in one way, pumps through this filter, mesh filter cleans it a little bit and then feeds it out the other direction. So not using this today, but that is an option out there if you need it. Now I understand this video has been a lot uh, and I would still encourage you if this is your first video watching on drip to go back and watch my last one that I did two years ago because I may have mentioned some things in there that I didn't mention here and I probably mentioned some things in here that I didn't mention in there. Uh, drip has a lot of parts but if you've ever put together a puzzle um, on your kitchen table, you can put together drip irrigation just knowing these basics. Now, what I'm going to show you next is my timer, specifically my beehive timer that I have been using for several weeks now. This variety, uh, prior to this, I had a single zone timer from Orbit and Beehive that I used for three years that have worked flawlessly for me. They are battery powered. Typically the batteries will last almost the entire growing season. Uh, it's going to depend obviously on how many times you're turning it on and off. Um, so if you're turning it on and off a lot, then the valve's got to open and close a lot and it's going to not run quite as often. I will tell you that running mine on my container plants um, at the old house twice a day, I ran it twice a day. Uh, for like eight to 10 minutes each. It lasted almost the entire growing season. Kind of petered out in August or September right before we ended up needing it. But you just replace the batteries, it gives you a warning and you continue using it. It just accepts double A's, which is nice, uh, easily accessible and inexpensive. But this is the new version and they have several different varieties of this. They have one that does one zone, one that does two zones, and then they have this one that does four which I got two of these and I'm probably going to get a two zone one in the spring for my front garden bed so I can run containers off of those. So right now I just have some manual hoses. These are the sprayers, one that goes to the barn, one that's been watering the shade bed over here on one side and one that's been watering the shade bed on the other side. I'm going to connect today's zone to this far one right here and then I can essentially eliminate these two zones and use them for other purposes next year. I won't need them right now. This one's going to stay because it's watering the shrubs to the barn until I get all of those planted. You'll notice that I have a little black backflow uh, device here connected between the timer and the hose bib. And here is the system. And I really like their new setup because you can control them manually on the interface. I will walk you over there and show you the old version, which you could only control with the app. So these can be controlled by Bluetooth, but they also have a Wi-Fi hub that you can purchase so you can control them anywhere. Uh, if you're going on vacation or something and want to send a little more water to your system while you're gone, you can make those changes if you buy the hub. Hub's not required, but that requires you to be in proximity to the device to use it. Of course, you can manually control all the settings and how long they're watering here and also in the app. But this device I have really loved so far. You also need to put it away before winter. As you notice it has a sticker here, it says keep from freezing. So when you start seeing your first um, frost and freeze coming along, you need to take this off. Uh, consider ending your watering for the season and bring it inside. Remove the batteries and store it safely so it doesn't uh, get damaged from winter freeze. This is one of my old beehives, which you can still purchase this version. They work perfectly fine. You can't manually control any of the options on the front of the device though. And you can see I've actually got a splitter before it so I can run the water hose separately. Uh, next year, I'm gonna be replacing this with at least a two valve. I may get another four valve just to have the availability of one. Um, but this one works just as well too, but it's just controlling one zone. You can see I go down here and add a T and run the line along the ground there. Um, and it's working really well for me. I've also pre-ran some quarter inch drip for the containers next year. Um, 
two over there where I have the one on the little stand. So this will stay until next spring when I need it. Uh, and this is just a simple one valve setup that you might be able to use at your home. Now how I'm going to do this, I'm going to set up the camera and do a time lapse. Um, I'm not going to walk you through everything step by step as I create the video. I will do that at the end, but I want you to see the process of how I do it um, so you can understand it's not that difficult to do. You just got to have all the pieces up front um, and there can be a lot of pieces depending on what you're going for. Right here, there's not going to be a whole lot. There's going to be some landscape staples, um, which I forgot to mention in this video. I purchased landscape staples from Sandbaggy. I think they're available on Amazon now, but you can get a ton of them for a very good cross. Do not go to uh, Lowe's, Home Depot, or the big box store and buy irrigation staples. You will spend a fortune for like 10 and you'll need way more than 10 to put in your drip irrigation system. Buy them in bulk uh, online from a company that specializes in landscape staples. They'll be thicker, higher quality, hold into the ground better and be much cheaper for you. So I mentioned that in the last video, which is a nice tidbit that I went over. So I would still encourage you to watch that last video from two years ago because there's a lot of information in there as well. All right, I'm gonna set up the equipment and then I'll let you watch and follow along and we'll connect afterwards and I'll walk you through what I did. All right, I'm all done. So let's talk a little bit about the process and how much things I used. So I have the black distribution tubing that runs from the irrigation valve um, beehive system down. Now this is loose, but as I've mentioned in several videos, we're having geothermal installed. I don't want to put this tight against the house yet because uh, I actually might come through and add with the block that I have left over a rock that I showed you in a separate video another tier here so I can dig down below this brick a little bit um, and then I can plant up these spaces. So I will adjust the length of this at a later time but you can imagine that that's kind of flat on the ground or you can also bury it underneath the ground and then I connected here to the half inch 18 inch spaced emitter tubing and I used roughly 125 feet of that linear feet I would say so I've got an elbow down there just a straight connector here and I think I used about three or four T's um, you which you saw me connect there's a T there which ends the loop that went through this entire process um, and there's a couple more that I had to fit in because this bed gets skinnier and I'll show you those right here so there's one here you can see I ran it down but I also needed to cover more of the space, so I teed in there, I teed in down there, 
and it actually may be the only tees I have, so there's just three. But you can see the irrigation starts here. It runs all the way down in a zigzag, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and then runs back up here and ties back in to where it originally started. That will give you even pressure over the entire system. Um, and then I will start this running here in a second and show you what the results are. Uh, because it's that simple. Um, you can see how I've kind of spaced these apart. Now, the spacing's not necessarily even, but there's also no plants here. And I've spaced these plants where they're going to get really large and cover the ground. They're kind of spaced at their max size when they grow up. I also, you'll notice most of the time, put the drip, is, drip emitters on the back side of the plant. That's because this ground slopes downward. So any drip that comes behind it is going to flow forward. Also, every plant may not have like an emitter on it because these are spaced 18 inches apart. Uh, typically, I have just kind of naturally learned how to space my plants where drip emitters hit them perfectly. Uh, but 18 inch seems to be kind of the perfect sweet spot for getting drip to m almost every plant. Some things in here, like these right here, they don't necessarily have an emitter on them. But there's an emitter up here somewhere that will kind of flow down and get water to its root system as it becomes more established. So. There are some things I might have to spot water here and there uh, if they seem to be struggling because there may not be drip directly on the plant initially, but as those root in, they'll be much better. Now the hydrangeas, there are an emitter right behind it as well. If they start wilting in the afternoon heat, I can poke a hole in this 18 inch spacing emitter tubing and pop another emitter in there. When you are cutting, this uh, drip system, you have to be pretty careful to make sure you don't cut through an emitter or on either side of the emitter. I want to show you this tubing here that I got. It was actually cut from the factory, but you can see what these emitters look like inside, and I had to cut this off. So if you see this little black dot, you need to come down a few inches. So you can see kind of right there, it ends. It's a small one or two inch area where you shouldn't cut and it's hard if you squeeze that part of it. So you'll notice when I was adding the T's in in the video, if the time lapse called it, I was looking for those black holes because I didn't want to cut too close to them when I was putting in the T's or you'll cut through that and then you'll just have to cut the entire emitter out and then you'll have one less emitter which may not be a problem depending on where you're uh, spacing or cutting your pipe but it may require you to add in a manual emitter if you accidentally cut it and you needed an emitter in that location. So just something to be aware of there. And that is pretty much it. Um, let's think about cost to do this to your beds. So um, the timer, let's leave out the timer because those are ranged all over the place and you don't have to have one. So there's going to be some upfront cost with acquiring drip supplies. I tend to purchase everything in bulk because I'm going to be doing lots of beds. Um, you can purchase things sometimes just like four to a bag. Um, and that they're generally just three to four dollars for a few things. What I would recommend um, is you get things from Amazon in bulk anyway because you can usually buy more and you may need the pieces later and then organize them so you don't lose them. That's the important part of having an organization drawer. So the 100 foot of 18 inch um, spacing emitter tubing, roughly 15 to 20 dollars a roll. And so I used one and a quarter of those. So let's just say that's 30 dollars. The fittings, honestly, very cheap if you buy them in bulk, probably less than 50 cents a piece. So Let's say that's $35 for all the little fittings. The end connector that connects it to the hose bib, also super cheap. Uh, let's just say that's $2. So for $40-ish, minus the timer, the backflow device is also only $6 or $7. So less than $50 I put together drip on this bed, which means I will never have to hand water it again, potentially, after it gets settled in. Uh, if I start experiencing any issues, I can add additional emitters in locations where I need them next to the plant. If you want the timer, that's an initial upfront cost, but if you buy a multi-valve one like I have, 
you can water multiple zones uh, and then this can be the only bed on the zone or you can tie additional beds into this zone so what i'm going to do which i'm not going to show on camera but i'm going to try and get it done this morning um, is add a line of the black distribution tubing from this bed or i might come out of the black distribution tube up there and come down the fence line here and connect into this bed for the hydrangeas because over the next week i'm going to be adding another bed over here on this side and i want to make sure i get water on these new things that i'm planting here as well so the black irrigation tubing can be trenched under the ground um, if it's going to be in an area that's going to be driven over or anything i would recommend you run pvc and the black tubing through it just to have some more uh, structural integrity um, Right here, we're just going to be walking over it, which was, isn't a problem if you're putting it in the ground. But let's turn the system on and I'll show you what it looks like. This is the Beehive app. I'll turn my um, phone around and I actually do a screen recording on my phone right quick so I can just put it on the screen and walk you through it. Okay, so this is my north home four zone timer. You can switch to the various timers in here. I have a south one, the front home, which is one zone that I showed you earlier. And then I have an extra one that's currently unused and I may use that in the future somewhere else in the garden. But this is the basic beehive setup. You can see that my valve has 96% battery left and it's connected by Wi-Fi with a little symbol before there. You can see the weather conditions. And right now, I want to water this zone manually. So you can see the various zones here. Right now, four is unused right here where it says unused, but that is going to be called shade bed now. And I'll remove zones uh, three because that was where the overhead sprinkler was going. And you can do various programs. So I have like the barn shrubs watering two times a day for 20 minutes right now. I'll create a new um program for this bed and have it watering you know as needed as I feel that is needed for this bed based on this new planting and you can adjust it later. So let's go home and I want to manually water this bed and I will show you what that looks like. So we're just going to do it for 10 minutes. Hit start. It's going to start the timer and you may hear the drip system kick on. Probably not because the air conditioner is running but it'll take a minute and then let me find an emitter that's facing upwards so we can see the water running through it. And here you see it's dripping water. So it just puts out just a tiny bit of water. You can see it in all these little emitters here that'll just kind of saturate the ground in this location. I just turned it on to show you. It's actually pretty damp uh, from some overnight high humidity we had. Our dew point's pretty high. So I'm not gonna water this very long because it's already kind of wet, but that's the simplicity of drip irrigation. Now, before I put mulch in this bed, I'm going to plant some bulbs and I'll show you that in a separate video. Uh, I wanted to go ahead and put mulch down on this bed, but I didn't get to it this week. And I've been waiting to put the drip down. So we're going to plant some bulbs and some spaces here because this does get enough sun to kind of support some daffodils early in the spring. And I can plant them around where other things will grow over and cover the foliage later. Now what I didn't do in this video is come through and run drip to this bed, but what I'm going to do is tee off up there and run down and also run it through this bed. I'm going to do that right now uh, and then I will show you what that looks like in the end. All right, so I finished this bed and I'm running out of supplies, so I got to order more supplies. I used about almost the rest of the 75 foot of that roll, but you'll notice it's a tear down from this other bed. So running down is fine. Running up is also okay if you have enough pressure. Um, I don't always recommend it depending on how extensive your zone is, but this is a newer bed, so that's not much of a problem. Now I've got it connected back here at the back. Uh, I'll show you right quick and show you how convenient these 90 degree um, connecting connections are. So I teed in here and this will run over behind. You'll really never see it from this side of the bed. I came down and added another 90 right there. And then I teed into this drip here and you can see it's dripping now. I'm also going to add drip under this step at a future time. But I want these in this area to have enough water so it's well established or can get well established um, until next year. Having a lot of like wild onion coming up. It could also be seed heads from this Millennium Allium. 
but a lot of wild onion coming up I need to take care of before I mulch. But you can see these drippers are dripping and it kind of runs in between, zigzags around and connects back to itself there where I have that connector. So this bed is one that's going to get more sun than the one behind it, but they're connected into each other. That means uh, the hydrangeas in this bed that currently just have maybe one emitter on them, I may have to pop another one in there to keep those happy and from wilting in the afternoon. We'll just have to test it and see if this bed holds enough water to keep those happy as they get established. If not, it's as simple as popping a hole and um, that tubing with this little hole punching gun I showed you earlier and popping one of these emitters in there. Let's show you right quick. There we go. This two gallon right here. This is what I would stick in there after that hole is punched. This end, this barbed in through. Don't put it in backwards. You might be tempted to put this end in. It's the black side that goes in to the tubing. Now I understand this video is getting pretty long, but it was intended to be because it's an educational exercise to show you some things. Now we'll go to the front and I'll show you how I did that drip when I just kind of had a black distribution tubing uh, as backbone and connected emitters to that tubing and run quarter inch drip off of them. So you can see here I have my half inch drip backbone running all the way back at the back of this bed. This is the quarter inch for the containers I told you about earlier. Into that, I've got a connector right here, and it runs up to this hydrangea, and there's a T, and there's a two gallon per hour here, and a two gallon per hour on the other side over there. So this is how you connect the quarter inch to the half inch. You can see I've done the same thing here. I have the half inch, and then I have this quarter inch that's running all the way here to this hydrangea. And I've done everything in this bed that way. So the U's have it on it, that Arborvitae have it on it. You can also, if you don't need as many emitters, connect the emitter first to the half inch tubing, connect the emitter and then do the quarter inch afterwards. And in that case, there's no emitter on the end. I like this method if I don't wanna spread the distribution, a lot of water across the root ball like I do with my hydrangeas. But in this location, I am planting lavender in the spring because I like a nice lavender hedge so it'll go on both sides of this container. So I'll probably put a T and come out with the half inch emitter tubing and go down and around and come back down this way and go back to the backbone of this drip here. You can, of course, also just connect the emitters directly to the tubing and leave them like this without any quarter inch. Uh, typically, I am attaching quarter inch to this when I need to run it further length from the distribution tubing. One thing about drip, uh, adding plants after you have drip in place, if you have a lot of it, uh, can be a little more difficult just because you got to make sure it's out of the way or you'll sink your shovel into it. You've watched me on camera when I was pruning my lavender hedge, cut my distribution tubing in half with the hedge shears. So there are repairs needed here and there, and that's why I recommend you just gather a bulk of supplies uh, that you can use from time to time to repair things and have on hand. That way you don't have to wait and order something, and then you won't be able to run your system for several days until it arrives, or if you don't have anything locally you can purchase, uh, waiting for that shipping as well is also a pain. So I hope this video was helpful. I know it was long, but I wanted to be really in-depth with this process to set you up for success if you wanted to do drip irrigation in your garden. I'm glad there's finally some going into my garden because it allows me just to sit and forget these beds and focus on other parts of the garden and not spending my afternoons watering when we have uh, early sunset days and I'm losing light really quickly. I don't have to worry about coming home after work and watering. I can get more tasks done uh, that are more important at the time. There'll be lots of links below to all sorts of items if you are interested in drip and you have questions, drop them in the comments below. I will answer those to the best of my ability uh, and provide you links if I need to, to the, some things um, and some resources that might be helpful. Thanks for following along, guys. And remember, in a world full of hate, be light. Take care.